So welcome to the Blanton. I'm Veronica Roberts. I'm the Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art, and I am so pleased to welcome you all tonight for a very special conversation with artist Jeffrey Gibson and the exhibition curator Tracy Adler, who is the director of the Welland Museum at Hamilton College, where this exhibition originated. As many of you know, today we unofficially opened the exhibition, This is the Day, featuring over 50 works Jeff made in the past five years. The amount of work he has produced in that time and its quality is staggering. The museum galleries will be open until eight, as Carlotta mentioned, so if you haven't seen the show yet, I encourage you to head over after the talk. The format of tonight's talk is that Jeffrey, Tracy, and I will be in conversation for about 45 minutes, and then we'll open things up for Q&A from all of you. Before I formally introduce Jeff, or very informally introduce Jeff and Tracy, I would like to thank a few people who were essential to the exhibition coming to the Blanton, Jeannie and Mickey Klein, Suzanne Deal Booth, and Bridget and Patrick Wade. I would also like to thank our extraordinary installation crew. Even the little beaded paintings were actually very heavy. Um, Clark Aldrich, Matt Langlin, and Greg Valentine. Many thanks as well to Cassandra Smith, Krista Ramirez, Shelby Lackens, Kim Thiel, Rebecca Skrobarinek, and Stacy Hoyt. And I owe a very big debt to Lynn Mayfies, curatorial assistant, who has been an indispensable partner on every aspect of this project. Finally, it is my pleasure to introduce Jeff and Tracy. Jeffrey Gibson is an interdisciplinary artist based in upstate New York and on faculty at Bard College. He is currently included in the 2019 Whitney Biennial. If you go, do not miss the incredible oversized flag he made over the ticket desk in the lobby. It's kind of hard to miss. He has upcoming exhibitions at the Esker Foundation, the Brooklyn Museum, and Socrates Sculpture Park in Long Island City. The rest of your, his bio you can find online. Um, as a curator, the sweet spot in contemporary art for me is work like Jeff's, art that brings together exquisite craftsmanship and layered complex ideas. His work is joyful, inclusive, and optimistic. But as a curator I admire named Anne Elgood has written, the celebratory known of Jeff's, tone of Jeff's work does not belie an astute sense of criticality. She talks about his work as having a critical exuberance. The first work you encounter in the exhibition, these two side by side, epitomizes this spirit. It's a large beaded wall hanging emblazoned with the affirmative text, I am alive, you are alive, we are living. I find myself asking who the pronouns of this text refer to. As a Native American artist, is Jeff referring to the resiliency of Native American culture? As a queer man, is he referring to the resiliency of the LGBTQ community? To sound this note of inclusivity and positivity implies a struggle and hints at also at the traumas, for example, the indigenous communities have endured. When so many of us think of Native American art, the image that comes to mind is perhaps of artifacts from the past. This exhibition maps out a vibrant present and future possibilities. Jeff, I also appreciate that as the home of Ellsworth Kelly's Austin and his spectrum of color, with the addition of your very colorful work, you've turned the Blanton into a double rainbow. <laughs> the show is, of course, above all, a reflection of Jeff's immense talents, but it's also a testament to what a great artist can do when he gets to collaborate with a great curator. Tracy Adler is the Johnson Pote Director of the Ruth and Eller Wellen Museum of Art at Hamilton College, which opened to the public in October 2012 under her leadership. She, I've gotten so many compliments on the paint colors in the show, I keep getting these compliments, that was Tracy. Um, full credit where credit is due. She also commissioned the remarkable video in the exhibition, and as Jeff shared with me, it came about after Tracy asked him the question, what is one thing you have always wanted to make but not had a chance to do? What a beautiful question that artists wish they heard more often. The film adds an important layer to the exhibition with Macy, a trans woman on a Choctaw reservation in Mississippi, as its protagonist, and the extraordinary throat singing by artist Tanya Tagik, providing a kind of soundtrack to the show that drifts in all the other galleries. If you haven't had a chance, and if you haven't had a chance to see the gorgeous publication that the Wellen produced, I encourage you to take a look. The first time I saw it, I joked with Jeff that he should be really happy and not expect to ever get another book like that. So please um, join me in welcoming Jeff and Tracy to the stage. All right, well, I'd love to start with you, Jeff man of the hour. So I want to talk 
I want to ask you about text in your work um, because it plays such a pivotal role and I don't think I've ever worked on an exhibition where um, the lyrics of Boy George and the words of James Baldwin are in an exhibition coexisting together, um, which I uh, love and appreciate. So can you talk a little bit about sort of how text evolved into your practice and where you get the sources, where, where, what some of your sources are? I'm sure, is that very loud? But um, I suppose my first introduction to, to really text, um, I started reading James Baldwin when I was very young. Part of it had to do with being aware of people like James Baldwin and Nina Simone who left the United States to find creative freedom and then their reaction when they would come back to the US. And my father was a civil engineer with the Department of Defense, so living in Germany and Korea, I, um, I felt like maybe a citizen of the world as opposed to just being American, but I felt also as an artist very committed to forming a practice here, representing being American with the kind of complexity of being aware of things going on around the world. I think um, Nina Simone's lyrics um, in particular, Mississippi Goddamn, because my father's from Mississippi, and just thinking about um, how somebody could make uh, music, you know, it's not, it's, they're not always protest songs, but they're kind of imbued with politics and history and, and feeling and emotion. Um, similarly with James Baldwin, I think also being a, a man of color and, and openly gay um, in certain circumstances. And then, um, in college at the Art Institute of Chicago, I discovered uh, or was introduced to Raymond Carver, um, short story, American short story writer. And part of that class was also to write short stories and how difficult it was to um, learn how to write sh briefly. It's really difficult. And, um, and, and so maybe I always wanted to be a writer mm -hmm. on some level and um, jump forward to me working, um, I always really enjoyed titling my work, and I think it's a missed opportunity when artists choose not to title their work. So the words have always existed, but usually in titles that people wouldn't see. Um, and eventually, my, my love in making is abstraction and process-oriented making, it's meaning that I don't always know where it's gonna end up. I just kind of um, take one step until I figure out what the next step is. And that abstraction was oftentimes met with people relying on the formal qualities to engage with it. And I felt like I needed to name this abstraction with what was really articulated in my head. So I saw putting the words in it as just naming it, sort of like the last step and like, well, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm going to just spell it out for you. <laughs> um, and I realized that you know, music has been a big part of my um, kind of my, my personal world, very like intimate personal world for a very long time. And I think when you're American and you're moving around the world a lot, and we moved about every two or three years, music, in particular American pop music, really kind of identified me in many ways. And I think by the time I moved back to the US when I was about 16 um, and started going at that point to um, gay clubs in DC, uh, that music in particular, in combination with witnessing, although young and not impacted in certain ways, um, the AIDS crisis and, and meeting older generations of gay men who were experiencing losing all of their friends and their lovers. Um, I look at those lyrics now and I realize they're, they're an intense mix of loss, mourning, but also love and joy. Mm -hmm. So. And, and then since then, it's, it's, it's shifted to be about authorship and, of course, questions about appropriation. And, um, and I think the next chapter has to be me beginning to find my own words and authoring those. And some of your work does have your own words already, right? Yes. The one that I was mentioning that is at the entrance of the show, Alive, that, yes. that one's That's you. mine. And I, I think also it's, um, I do think appropriation is a form of one's own voice. I mean, I've begun to think about, you know, even though we might all recognize many of these songs, we all heard them under different circumstances at different times and they resonated differently with us. So if you're imagining, uh, let's say, someone that you were in love with, with a certain song, that person was different for all of us. So although the words are there, they're really a trigger to kind of start like an internal conversation about, with yourself, about who you are and, and your relationships. I think it's such a beautiful entry point, though, that we have those songs in common and like all connect to those words. And I think that's part of what makes your work um, 
accessible in a wonderful way. Um, and I wanted to ask you, Tracy, so as uh, it's pretty unusual for an artist of Jeff's age and point in his career to have two shows 34. traveling. <laughs> Not really, 47. <laughs> Um, to have two shows traveling at the same time across the country. Um, and uh, so there's another exhibition that was organized by the Denver Art Museum, and I, I believe it is in Madison now? It's in Madison right Madison now. Madison right now. Um, so I'm curious, knowing that there was this other exhibition, what did you want to sort of focus on and highlight and really emphasize in your show? Sure, well, it was actually, can you hear me? Should I hold this closer? Okay. Um, it was actually quite liberating um, because in a way the work of doing a mid-career retrospective was taken care of. So I didn't feel as though it needed to be this comprehensive look back on you know, everything that um, Jeff had done as a mature artist and it really liberated us also to have dialogues about things that he wanted to explore and really um, create an exhibition that was pointing a new direction towards the the ideas and the mediums and the notions that he was being attracted to. And you know, when when I saw the Denver show, I was kind of relieved because I was like, well, there's definitely not gonna, there's really no crossover. They both say different things. And so, um, and you know, we, in our many conversations, one of the things that we started to talk about was the influence of fashion on Jeff's work and the garments, which, you know, have become a big part of Jeff's practice, evolved for this exhibition, to debut in the exhibition. Um, and the helmets as well, and the film I was here. And so also it was about really having this collaboration where we were creating um, a, a space for Jeff to have the agency and license and time, space, and resources to explore new directions. Because I think that's really exciting. I think it's wonderful to look back on an artist's work. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, thank you to the Denver Art Museum for doing that. And then, you know, for us, it really gave us just true license to be, um, um, to be more free in the way that we explored the exhibition. Well, I think that freedom really shows. And for me, when I saw the exhibition, I didn't get to see, I haven't seen the Denver one, although many of my colleagues have. Um, but for me, when I saw the exhibition, um, when I saw the garments, the seven garments that were in the show, that was like such a, a knockout and so impactful to me. I'm still, um, I was doing docent training the other day and I, it was like hard for me to move on from them. Like I just wanted to like talk for one hour about one garment. <laughs> um, people like us, that's the one I wanted to talk mm. about. Here, here they are. Um, and so what a gift to give an artist an opportunity to make new work and have that new work be some of the best work that they've ever made. Um, and I can see that it, but I think it's interesting, like the, I'd love to talk about the garments, Jeff, and because um, I think they are so important, but I also, these fashion photos, can you explain a little bit? Like I was struck mm -hmm. by the fact that so often we separate like, f like fashion and fashion photography and artwork. Mm -hmm. And you're very much about collapsing highs and lows and all of these sort of classifications in your work, but I was really amazed by the fashion photos and I'd love for you to just share kind of how those came about. Um, sure, well, you know, so Jeff had been working on these on these uh, beautiful garments and then we had them photographed and Jeff's like, they're so flat. I was like, yes, because they're flat. <laughs> and so and so I said, well, you know, you know, because we've been having all these discussions about fashion, especially fashion of the 80s and, you know, and, and fashion in the 80s is different. It was like before fast fashion. So mm -hmm. it was really street fashion was informing high fashion. It was like this low to high mm -hmm. um, kind of uh, kind of approach. And I think Jeff's work is too. It's also very individualistic in that way. Um, and so I said, you know, what if we hired a fashion photographer? So I hired someone that I've known for a long time, Caitlin Mitchell. Um, and what if we put the garments on people and it had them activated as though they were sculptures. And I was thinking about uh, Noguchi's Cave of the Human Heart, mm -hmm. uh, in which Martha Graham really like activates this sculptural mm -hmm. object. Um, that was sort of the first initial idea. And so, you know, Jeff uh, selected the models and it was really important to him um, that they were people of different body types, of different, you know, um, backgrounds and that they all brought their own personalities to it as well. And, and it was just uh, really exciting to see them activated in the way that, um, that, they, that they became both with the helmets and with the garments. 
And Jeff, can you talk a little bit? I think that we see in this work, be, um, because the beadwork has so many obvious connections to Native American um, art and traditions, I feel like when, when you see the garments, you start to notice how many other cultures, cultural references you're bringing in. For me, they look like samurai. Um, or can you, can you talk a little bit about some of the, um, the, some of the cultures and different ideas you sort of brought together in those works? Yeah, and I, I also want to say that between the two exhibitions, um, John Lukovic, who's the curator of of, the, of like a hammer, you know, he his background is really in Native American material cultures, and so I think that audience has been supportive of me since the beginning of me making work and exhibiting. But you really do feel a commitment to um, kind of focusing the visual language onto that subject. And when Tracy and I met, we talked about. Like, what if you didn't? Ha what if I didn't have to feel responsible for that? What if I could just like put that down and make work from from a different place? And and so we started talking about you know everything from um, just different subcultures, which which are in the other works, but I think in the context of the other exhibition, they're kind of so deeply embedded, they they never they rarely rise to the top, um, and it's also a very different audience, I would say, and so. Um, yeah, the other, the other parts in there were, um, so the original inspiration for the garments were a couple of, couple of things. So in Canada, in the early 20th century, um, potlatch was banned, and um, the garments and the masks and the regalia used for dancing were confiscated by the government and were deemed to be contraband. And so um, it took a long time, you know, potlatch went underground, and, um, and now potlatch is, is legal and people celebrate it. But this idea that the garments were contraband, I thought was really interesting because it and, and made me think about why a garment was threatening to anyone on a political level. Because it's not a, um, it's not a militaristic, like cultish um, branding of identity, um, but it's really a practice which is about cultural survival and continuity. Um, and so there was that, and then there was also um, the ghost dance movement, which happens in the late 19th century. And um, there was a Paiute man who has a vision, um, uh, um, and Wovoka is his name. And, um, and in his mind, he, was, he wanted to establish a pacifist movement um, where if you danced and prayed and you made these ghost dance shirts, that they would protect you from the violence of colonial settlers. And so, um, and of course that didn't happen, but the ghost dance movement has continued. There's still people who practice it today. And there's reason to believe that he was actually inspired by Mormon protective undergarments. So in this age of thinking about- Okay, amazing, yeah. sorry. Yeah, no, for that. <laughs> because there, and there, there is recorded history of him um, having contact with Mormon communities there and learning about it, and he writes about it. Wow. So in this day and age when we're talking about you know, whose narrative is whose or whose history belongs to who, I'm a real firm believer that you know, everything has always rubbed shoulders up against everything else and influenced each other. I like to think that there's an ethical way to how you kind of re-articulate some of those things, and, but it's not, it's not black or white, certainly. It's, it's definitely a, a world of grays. And um, so in that sense, uh, that was, you know, and it's important, like my subject is not ghost dance, mm -hmm. but it's more these kind of topics about um, narratives, visual material influences, trade, um, even conceptual trade. You know, it's not always an actual object, but sometimes it's like the influence of different definitions of faith or how you practice faith. Um, and also care and protection. I, you, I've heard you talk about the garments in terms of, you know, the yes. idea that a work of art could help protect you or, yeah. you know, that this garment could be, um, I mean, you mentioned the banning of them and how fascinating that is, but there's right. a sense of, um, I, th I always thought that was really interesting and even the, the way you've incorporated blankets. We think blankets are right. the most fundamental form of care for, you know. Yes. Well, if you're Native American, it's the most Maybe fundamental form, form of, of giving death. yourself smallpox. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's on the list. That's on the list. So, um, but then yes, it transitions into care. Yeah. And but it also trans. You know, I was I was mentioning to someone today that, um, well, I don't want to get off track too much, but really the what brought weaving a blanket to to an end was at the end of the 19th century. The, um, the distribution of commercial, commercially produced blankets. So just in terms of cost, to have a blanket woven was about $100, but to buy a commercially produced wool, nice blanket was three. 
So it suddenly took something that was outside of a um, capitalist market, you know, put a price tag on it where only certain people can afford it, and then that's where it comes to an end. So, yeah, blankets are very charged. They're very charged. And I, but I think that about most things. I mean, everything's charged. But. I mean, also looking at the scale of the garments as well. Um, I mean, Jeff loosely based it on his own proportions. He's a very tall guy, yeah. but also they're they're intended to be oversized. So it's interesting to see, especially in, in the photographs. It's interesting to see what what happens when different different people inhabit them. Like, you know, sometimes it feels as though they are they're empowered by them. Sometimes it feels as though they are you know, um, I I immersed in them. So it is, it, I think there's also, there's like this multi-layered way of viewing what the garments are and can be as well. And, and the other things were certainly samurai armor, huge um, inspiration for these, but also um, Tlingit armor, which is like composited from like different small wood pieces, but allow the body to move because it's articulated into these kind of facets of of what what can be fish fish scales, um, shark skin, like really amazing materials that that you wouldn't associate with protective materials, and then of course you bring in symbolism, like the iconography that exists on you know traditional historical garments, and you often have a sort of circular. Um, beaded uh, section in the, uh, right here that looks kind of like a face almost. And I get asked a lot about that. So I wonder if, if you can share a little about that. I mean, I think a lot of that. So uh, this iconography that exists on ghost dance shirts, you know, you'll see a lot of repetitive um, kind of motifs. But then also sometimes there's, there's in really individual personal symbolism that we don't really know what it means. Um, and so I was thinking I never, I never try to repeat historical kind of anything really. Um, and so I was like, well, what are, what's my symbolism? Do I have to generate symbolism? <laughs> and then I realized that that's what the last 15 years of my career has been about, was, was these images. So that's where the print came in of printing fabrics. Um, the faces that you're talking about really are extensions of, because I felt like they needed to have the craft that exists in like the figures or in the wall hangings. And so the faces were these beaded kind of emblems that I think really come from like the, the beaded figures or the... The, the beadwork in general. Um, but it was also an opportunity to bring in like bling, mm -hmm. you know? And so I'd go online and I would look, I was like, wow, holographic beads, click. <laughs> you know, it was like, like <laughs> copper, gold, silver, click, click, click. And, and that's really the history of what we deem traditional was, was really um, not feeling politicized in your choice to bring something into your making, you know, in terms of a material, but you really, you really charge it with a meaning. And that's, that's a very powerful thing that I think many people don't realize. I think it's what a lot of like punk rockers realized when they were like, I make my own clothes. It's important because I tore it. It's important because I burned it. It's important because I put a million safety pins in it. Um, but that sense of um, kind of a, a self-motivated individualism on any level is, is a very powerful thing for people. And there's one of them right there. Um, and that's actually the garment that um, incorporates two decommissioned liturgical robes. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I noticed that there's, there seems to be a presence or nod to, to religion and spirituality in your work as well. Yeah, I mean, um, it's funny. I guess part of it is you know, both of my grandfathers were Southern Baptist ministers. And um, founded their churches, so one in, in Conahata, Mississippi, and one in Briggs Community, Oklahoma. And I think, um, you know, I, I'm interested in representations of faith, and certainly, you know, my generation, of course, being, you know, involved with, like, punk and queer and, you know, wanting to be like, I'm an atheist, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God. But when a plane shakes, you're like, dear God, please let us make it down, you know? And I was like, well... It's, I kind, of, I kind of started looking at all of, and I think also like the Mormon undergarments and thinking about, you know, like how people have really invested their faith in what we put on our bodies. And so looking at the, the um, when I started buying um, decommissioned vestments, they're beautiful and they're from the mid 1800s, the ones that we got. And um, there's gold embroidered thread, and, and all of that choice of using gold embroidered thread and the labor is really representative of the commitment to this faith. And so I was looking for any example of that. But there's also that kind of Baroqueness 
in in that. And I kept also thinking about that scene in in Fellini. Um, what is the film? Is it Roma Roma? The the papal fashion show. Um, that's such an insane scene, but really kind of fantastic. So I think. Yeah, I don't know if that answers the question, but um, and there's still some that I like. I said earlier, I, I really haven't had the guts to like cut into or figure out what to do with. They're just too powerful. Like they're really powerful, hand painted depictions of papal characters, bleeding swans that are fully beaded. I mean, you just it's difficult to cut into that. I, I would also say like the way that they're, I, I feel like they're actually sort of a stitching together because you're taking these liturgical vestments, there's like this really groovy cosmic print in there, um, these like really gross caricatures of Native Americans and some silk cat as well. And it's all together. So I feel like in a way it's, it's, not, it's not taking apart, it's like resolving and bringing together all these different aspects of the work. Yeah, I think, uh, like my goal is never to offend anyone. I'm not looking to like fire anyone up on anything. So that's why I think it's important for people to know Like I did research to find out that it's like within the eyes of the church, with the Catholic church, when, when the vestments are decommissioned, they really do just become textiles. They become available to the world again as textiles. Mm -hmm. um, and I was thinking, I was like, well, what does Catholicism have to do with Native American histories? And that sounds like an obvious question because then it's like, oh, there's a huge history. Mm -hmm. There, But I'm also interested in thinking about what was happening in 1865 here, what was happening in 1865 in Mississippi, what was happening in 1865 in New York, you know, and those, even though they're, they're, they're far apart, they are concurrent histories. And through commerce and trade, there are interactions happening mm -hmm. that are, we're, we're, we're kind of um, like, we're planting seeds kind of in different histories, like throughout time. Yeah, and I, th I wanted to ask you about the helmets as well, which you made at around the same time, because I feel like with some of the garments, um, Tracy mentioned, you know, these liturgical garments that you've you've repurposed, but some of them have like mirrors on them and have a kind of uh, campier aesthetic, and I think you see that exploration in the helmets even more. And and I've um, I've, wa I've heard you talk really eloquently about k kind of kitsch as a strategy. I think it's kitsch has been so co-opted by um, advertising and mainstream media at this point. Um, but can you talk about the way that you use kitsch as a strategy in your work? Well, it's funny. I don't. I actually don't think I use it as a strategy as much as I just chose to indulge in it, you know? And it's sort of like, I think that there's that thing where um, the way that I think about performance is, I was, I was giving a talk at a, at, a, at a university one time and there was someone who I know was there because they wanted to hear about a person of color who was queer and like, how does that work in the art world? And they said, you know, um, can you talk about the performance of being a queer or brown person in the art world? And my answer was like, there's no performance. There's absolutely no performance. And it's and I think that it it is really like looking back and being like, I've actually been afraid of being seen as a campy gay man. You know, there's a because in the in the eighties and nineties, um, I just so the show I, was, I saw some of the paintings coming up here. The show was titled at um, Sycamore Jenkins last year, it was titled I Am a Rainbow Too. And it was really meant to explore the idea of the rainbow. And part of it had to do with, like, I grew up being like, I am not that kind of gay man. I'm not going to wear um, a rainbow necklace around my, I'm not going to, you know, wear rainbow anything. But, um, you know, just as you grow up, you realize what kind of fear that is. And then you're like, oh, no, actually, strength is indulging in it and kind of um, letting yourself fall where you're going to fall naturally as opposed to trying to, like, omit and edit and kind of perform. Mm -hmm. So um, so that's really, I think, the camp thing. I mean, there's the love one. I mean, who makes work about love? Like that's, you almost feel corny with that. That seems like a dangerous thing to do. It's a, it's a dangerous thing. Who's going to make work about peace? You know, I mean, who, and so those things were, when I would have those ideas, and I would be like, well, that's kind of why you have to do it, because like you're afraid to do it. So make a helmet about love. Make a helmet about peace. The one that throws people off is Oceana, which Oceana, um, for me, is is uh, obviously in anthropological terms has its own meaning. But for me, it's about the depths of the ocean that we still don't know very much about, and those spaces that are yet to be defined fully offer so much possibility for what the future could become. So I feel 
I've always felt very drawn to the ocean, but in particular, that's what that helm is, helmet is about. And then of course, death as something more than just the end of our mortal lives, but how do we think about death in a more transformative way? And then the clown, the clown as a cultural character who is, um, who can see everything because everyone dismisses them. And I guess I would add, um, just in terms of, of the helmets, is that, you know, especially the ones like, like peace and love that you were talking about, like, on the one hand, it's, a, it's extremely celebratory, but I think that they also point to the fact that those are very overwhelming emotions and thoughts mm -hmm. and feelings. Mm -hmm. And so what I like about it is that that duality exists simultaneously in the work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and I love that you, I'm glad that you bring, uh, brought up clowns too. Um, I generally find them totally frightening. Um, so I appreciate that they're not creepy clowns in your shows. Thank you for that. I already have a little bit of a fear of them. Um, but the clown kinds of, kind of comes up again and again. And it's in the text as well. There's that great work um, that you made that's in the second gallery. I think it's in such times clowns become witnesses. Um, so can you just talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so that... Um I hope I'm getting this correct in terms of the writer, but I believe it's a, it was it was a kind of a quote from Studs Terkel in an interview about referring to clowns in a book that he wrote. So he's writing about the working class. He's writing about um, prostitutes, homeless people, alcoholics, as this idea that um, they see everything because no one assumes that they're paying attention. So they actually get to see everybody not performing for them. Um, where it comes from for me is I'm a big fan of Sister Corita Kent. And um, I own, um, it's a four panel print that says damn everything but the circus. Mm -hmm. And in the first print, damn, it talks about the king and the king and the, and the subjects of, of society going out and partying. And, um, and then the, it kind of ends with just saying like, and in such times, clowns become witnesses. And of course, this was around the time when Trump was elected. And I think that people thought I did the shows that I've done since this administration came into office. I think um, I have, of course, thought about what's going on in our country, what's going on with, in our country in relationship to the world. But I was not actually referring to clown as a Trump. Or, no, sorry, Trump as a clown. <laughs> I was um, actually trying to give some honor to the clown, and maybe even trying to side myself with the clown, um, because I think when you um, you know, these, these ideas about invisibility or not having a voice, there's also something really, um, there's a great entitlement to being invisible. I mean, just imagine if you could be invisible, you could walk into any room, right? And people will do what they're gonna do anyways in front of you. So yeah, so that's, that's and, the, and the clown also for me, I mean, many indigenous cultures have clowns and, and they're really there to play the smart jokes on themselves and on other people. <laughs> and to generate um, a cathartic experience for people to not have to go to an emotional level that's abusive or angry or, you know. And I think in difficult times, we also rely on comedians to actually digest some of the things that we're, we're grappling with. So um, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I want to shift over to the video if, um, and talk a little bit, since you guys worked on that so closely together. And I would love to hear sort of how that evolved to, like what your original concept was and how you found Macy or, or where, where that started. Um, sure. Well, as you noted in your um, wonderful remarks, I did ask Jeff, like, what have you always wanted to do? What would you do if you could do anything? And he had just started experimenting um, in video. And so one of the things that he really wanted to explore was this idea of what does it mean to be gay on the, on, on the living on the reservation? And I'll let him talk about more about the themes and how that emerged. Um, but I paired Jeff up with a fantastic filmmaker and so it became a collaborative project as well between the three of us so that Jeff could really be free to you know, think about the concept and develop the script and, and to you know, visually engage in it and that um, the technical side of it would be taken care of by a professional filmmaker. And it was just a really synergistic relationship. And I'll let you talk about the themes in the, in the video. Well, it I, I repurpose a lot of materials in my work, uh, so the idea of the found object, and I think I've learned a lot about myself and my practice and having made that video. Um, you know, Macy is someone who I met through my cousin, Casey, um, and Casey I've known since they were born, but around the age of about three years old, 
um, they started biological male, born biological male, started wearing dresses. And over time, the family became ashamed of him, um, of them, when and they would only do it in this one room in the back of the house. And um, so as Casey got older, I approached them and I said, you know, I'd like to make this video. And initially, they were they were very excited about it. And I was looking for ways to do it um, in terms of like support. Uh, and um, through Facebook, I could see that Casey was going to New Orleans with two other um, trans women. And um, so then I asked them who they were. And that's how the introduction was made to Macy. And ultimately, people got really nervous and backed out as once it became a real possibility. Because being open, openly trans or openly gay on the reservation still puts your safety in jeopardy. So, um, but so I was really committed to Macy because she really was incredibly open. And she said that she just had come to a point in her life where she just was, was kind of hoping for opportunities to come that she could just take advantage of. So she said yes immediately. She did a lot of things that she was uncomfortable with, but she felt it was important for her to do. And she was kind of a conduit for me to experience what it's like or see what it's like as a queer person on the reservation in Mississippi. So, and Mississippi is a significant part of that. Um, and the video um, really shows her in her daily life. She worked at the casino. She's since lost her job, but she worked at the casino. Um, and there's this weird negotiation about how much public interface she has. And so the, the public still can like criticize and you know, how dare you let this kind of person hold, handle my food, um, serve me, um, suddenly treating her as if, you know, becoming very macho with her, sort of like tough. Um, and so we couldn't really film as much as I wanted to inside the casino. It's a very closed environment. And then the second half of the video is me kind of inventing. And, and again, she acts as a conduit for me in that I've grown up really afraid of the swamps of Mississippi and the lakes and the forest. And part of it is just Mississippi and my family telling me stories about church burnings, lynchings, mm -hmm. beatings, um, all sorts of physical violence. And in my mind, this is where you dump the bodies. So in no way am I going in there. But in this case, I thought, you know, that history is really denying me a relationship with the land. So what you see is her doing a self-baptism in order to really use the land both to acknowledge herself but also to give yourself back to the land. So And that's before you knew about the alligators. That's before I knew about there were alligators, apparently. Yeah. That's, yeah, a, that's true. That's to be a reason to be afraid <laughs> that of That would have been really bad. Yeah. God. Um, well we'll open up it up in a moment to questions, but I also wanted to just ask you um, if if you feel that um, any of the work has changed in any way since becoming a dad, or if that surfaces in the work at all? Um, I think if anything, maybe it's, maybe it's changed me a bit, mm -hmm. you know, just as a person. Mm -hmm. So, but I, you know, I feel like what I'm experiencing now as an artist, and I'd say this very openly, you can't plan for any of this, mm -hmm. right? This is something that you, you just, as an artist, maybe for many artists, you're kind of working, you make the work that you think is important. In terms of like an audience or people paying attention or finding it interesting, I can't control any of that. I think being a parent, um, I, I'm able to offer this world to them, like this vision of this world, which I think is significant and important. So, but no, I don't think they've entered into the picture yet. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. I, I think, I think, and it's funny, maybe it's another kind of weird fear of, of being the artist who suddenly started making work about the love of their children. Like, is that corny? I don't know. But maybe, right now I'm not ready to do that, but. Um, it's funny yeah. though, I, I think I just read into the, um, not long after your first daughter, I, I saw the, pun the punching bag with all of the hearts and the love, and I just couldn't help but think of, like, look at that work and think of you as a dad, just because that age of... I will say, as a, it, for me, as a strategy, mm -hmm. I, I purposely don't make connections emotionally to a lot of things, because otherwise I'd become too conscious and I wouldn't do it. So when I go to the studio, I really do try to keep it at a level of... of Play is maybe making it sound like it's always fun, 
but definitely sort of free associative kind of experimentation and play. Um, and then you step back and you kind of hope that something's working. I will say seeing the exhibition now, I'm impressed how many layers mm -hmm. are in some of the pieces that I didn't see before. Hmm. Like, and that's probably because of this strategy of not acknowledging a lot of things in the process of making. So when I see them now, I'm like, I'm like, oh, I didn't real, I just didn't realize how much was going in because I don't, I don't consciously articulate the layers. It's not, there's not a goal to have many layers. Well, and also the fact is when you guys did the show together, it was all, so much of the work was coming straight from the studio. So you haven't had that chance to kind of right. step back. So um, we're happy that we get to um, give that to you. Um, yeah, it's, it's been really wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I would also add just because the show closed in December at our venue, um, seeing, you know, and then of course it was in storage for a few months before I came here, seeing them again after having that break and that time to process them, it's like being reacquainted with old friends, really. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're sort of greeted by this tribune of elders in the garments and, um, and it's a welcome embrace. Well, that's a lovely note to turn things over to all of you. Um, if any of you would like to ask a question, um, I will try to see you first and then call on you. <laughs> Maybe we can turn the house lights on a little bit. All right, did I see a, okay, thank you, perfect, sorry. Hi, I have a question about uh, the turning point in your work where you began to use regalia, um, traditional materials in new ways. Um, well, I think, Okay, so this is kind of hover, right around 2011 is when this is happening. And I was really just very dissatisfied with showing abstract paintings to an audience that I think, even though I was referencing weaving, I was referencing color combinations that are specifically Choctaw, I was referencing basketry, um, parflesh painting. Once you put it on a canvas, it just becomes modernist formalism. They're like, this happened in the 60s, why do we care now? So. Um, the frustration led me to cut the paintings off of the canvas. That was also an intuitive decision. Take them to the laundromat in Brooklyn and wash them. And uh, when they shrunk, what happens is the cotton shrinks and the oil paint doesn't, so pieces popped off. But when they came out of the wash, they were completely transformed. They were textiles. And they were textiles that actually made me think about moving to New York, um, with aspirations of being an artist, um, failure, um, sadness, um, you know, and, and so this textile maybe resembled more what I was used to seeing in collections, uh, in museum collections. But they were also available to becoming other things. And I think that's when I started teaching myself how to bead and I taught, I, I beaded on, onto those pieces of fabric. Um, started thinking about fragments in the way that fragments exist in collections, and we don't always know the whole story. Um, and then at some point, I wanted to continue getting rid of the irony in my practice, and one of those things about irony was how many, and I'm sure if you're an artist in here, we've all done this, but you're interested in Tlingit armor. So I go and buy a book about Tlingit armor, or I Google images, but there's that the experience of handling and looking and maybe seeing things in movement and hearing. So I decided to get rid of the books and I wrote for money to go and meet with makers around the country. And that really changed a lot for me because I was meeting people who were making, not as artists in the world that I'm in, but really um, they were making objects with, with such intense commitment and faith about cultural survival and it had everything to do with the jewelry they were wearing, the drum that they made that they were playing, their garments that they were wearing. And um, when I returned to Brooklyn, I was suddenly surrounded by hundreds of artists who just were trying to get a gallery. So the comparison of those two things made me realize, I was like, maybe I don't care so much about being an artist. Maybe I just need to focus on what can I make that I think I would love to see in the world. And that eventually found its way into into what, what I do now. Um, and I think regalia for me was available because powwow is a public space more than any other social and physical space in indigenous communities. Um, and so I felt that there was language there that I could borrow from without stepping into places that I know I shouldn't. Question in the back. 
So certainly a lot of the textiles that inform your work aren't just for display. They're part of a performance or a, are used in some sort of public facing event. Have you thought of developing any kind of performance using uh, your textiles and garments? Yeah, in fact, the we I was just telling Tracy, it's since the beginning of this exhibition, I think we've done maybe six or seven performances in the last year. And um, and the most recent one was commissioned by the National Portrait Gallery. And so they commissioned a new performance that debuted in February. And then it was performed again in New York at the New Museum in um, May. And then it will be go to Calgary this fall and it will perform, be performed again. And this is a drumming performance um, with 50 different garments, 50 volunteers, 50 drums, and, um, and a series of texts that I authored. So, and you know, I make things, I love material things. So for the performance things are, are very frightening initially, but it was a real kind of validation to get a call from the National Portrait Gallery saying like, we've been paying attention to what you do with performance and we'd like to commission you to make a new one. And um, so yeah, so that's happening, that's happening. But it initially started with people saying that they want to, you know, what, is it, what does it look like when fringe moves? Like, what does it look like when someone knows how to move fringe as opposed to someone who doesn't? Um, same thing with the jingles or bells or any part of it. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a skill to someone who knows how to wear a garment and move their body, you know? So that's all informing the performance. In the back, up in the yellow. <coughs> My question is very much about performance. Um, I went all through your exhibit and loved everything. But then when I saw the clothes, it was, they were so still. And they demand movement. Mm -hmm. I just felt, I kept imagining the, the, uh, the stilt walkers in them. Mm -hmm. Or even um, to get the wonderful genius that did uh, those wonderful things on Broadway. With the Lion King, mm -hmm. I think her name's Julie. I can just imagine what she would do with your garments. Mm -hmm. I just keep yeah, I think it's interesting. I mean, the garments themselves open up to a lot of things, you know, and, and um, I think almost every garment that's on view there has been worn by somebody. And one of the things that's important to me is, again, I come from a generation that was taught to not believe that an art object can have aura or should have aura. You know, it has to be this inanimate thing. But um, and so that's really where it continues to be important to me to have people feel like they can engage with the work physically. Um, the photographs of people in the garments, it requires assistance to put on a garment. So as an individual, you can't just put one on. They're too heavy and cumbersome. Um, but we just did a series of photographs. Um, some of those will probably start to surface in, in addition to what you're seeing here. But also movement, and we've had people perform in them. And it's about giving the objects a, an, an aura of, of a history. You know, and, and the art world is perfect for that because it has to be documented. Right, that's the way the contemporary artwork works. So this history is, is not only happening, but it's being written down. So that's why it's important who I choose to wear the garment. It's important that there's, there's different kinds of bodies, and it's important that there's queer bodies, and male bodies, and female bodies, and disabled bodies, and challenged bodies. You know, that's, yeah, that's who they're for, you know? And I think even seeing them inanimately, it really just points to the potential that they can be activated. And you know, traditionally in longhouses, they were stored up in the eaves just in that way. So it is also a nod to historical as well as contemporary circumstances. Mm -hmm. Question in the front. Yes, I have a question about the jingles. Uh, I noticed that they're all <coughs> stamped with the emblem of like a tobacco, a mm -hmm. can of tobacco, and it just feels like settler colonialism, but then there are these beautiful jingles. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah, I mean, I think my love of the jingle is, um, I could go on this for a long time, but You've I'll just give you the short a can answer. Of worms. Yeah, I've done a talk entirely about the jingle. Um, so originally the jingle were lids of tobacco and snuff containers, you know, and so when you look at historical objects, like you'll see things like thimbles and spoons and needles being used as adornment. Um, and um, and then and you'll see full dresses in 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 um, historically, but t right at the turn of the century is really when you see them. Um, and the jingle dress dance actually emerges out of another vision that somebody had, and the story is that his granddaughter was sick, and then he had a dream 
that um, there was a dress covered in these 10 jingles. And so he asked his wife to make them, and then there would be women who would dance for his daughter, and then she got better. And this is the beginning of what then becomes a very gendered, um, historically rooted dance. What's exciting for me about that is when we think about tradition, there's always like the problem of it being so static and people being um, maybe, maybe confused or ambivalent about how do we change a tradition to support ourselves for who we are now. This is one of those examples. The jingle dress dance comes out of that decision to break away from what has or hasn't been done in the past and, and authoring something new. And same with ghost dance movement, same with powwow. And so for me, those are representative of a modernism within indigenous cultures that isn't acknowledged as modernism, but it is radical change in the face of radical shifting circumstances in order to support oneself. So um, that's really my interest in the jingle. What, what I use, which is, continues this interest, is those are produced in Taiwan by a non-native man um, who is part of the powwow circuit in Texas, um, and, um, and he has them patented. And, and that's not a criticism, to be honest. That, to me, is interesting because, again, when we think about Native American histories, we don't think about um, economies or markets. And this, there's no other use for the jingle. So this is something that is produced by the millions, much in the same way abroad as other places. Um, and then the stamping to me is interesting because it's totally ironic. That is a kind of icon that's been produced to be representative of the past mm. and the Western past. Mm. So to me, that little thing is so loaded, but it also has another, another meaning and context within Native cultures, and in particular with, with women. And wait, just back up. You said that they're mostly made in Taiwan. They're all made all in Taiwan. All made in Taiwan. But what is the Texas connection then? They're the man here? who patented it lives oh. in Texas. Oh my gosh. Okay. That's amazing. Wait, is that true? He, his business is run out of Texas. Okay. Yeah. I okay. mean, crazycrow.com. Crazy Crow. Yeah, yeah. they on the border with I'm Oklahoma. Not, yeah, you not, can order them. Yeah, you can order them. Um, and I will get the left side in just a second. We've got Andrea. Uh, I'd love to hear about the ceramics and um, both the traditions that you were inspired by and then your approach to using that medium, which the process seems so very different than the intricate feeding. Well, between the, um, you know, with the, with the craft, handcraft side of what the studio does, you know, it has to be so perfect. And so um, the amount of perfection to get straight lines with the regularly shaped beads is an effort in itself. You know, everything gets drawn, everything gets measured and mapped out. Um, the paintings with the, you know, they're, they're, everything has to be clean. All the measurements have to be down to the 32nd of an inch. Um, and I just wanted to get my hand back involved in things, but also I've always been um, really drawn to the Mississippian head pots um, from the Mississippian culture, and Mississippian culture in particular because it still is one of those places that's not fully articulated in terms of what happened to that, that civilization, and it's also provocative within the world of um, anthropology because it's not yet fully realized, or it's not fully recognized as a civilization. And if it was, it means that there was a fully realized civilization here pre-contact. So that may not be radical to anyone, on, but that's a radical thing. That, that's a huge shift in, in the way we think about history. So, um, and those head pots I chose because um, they feel available to me because we don't really know what they were for. So um, a, a lot of the symbolism of Mississippian culture, we actually don't know what it is. It's very, it, it speaks to the idea that there may have been other cultures that influenced what was going on. The, the, the shapes are very um, Mesoamerican mm -hmm. and um, a lot of the practices. So you begin to wonder like who was, who was talking to who in those days, you know? Um, and so, and then, and then when I started working in clay, it really is just, you know, it's this visceral kind of um, material and putting holes in the heads and, and letting them kind of be both in ways and out ways in a head. It's just, I'm hoping to go back into making more, more right now. But, um, and then actually as part of this exhibition, the, the kind of piles on the English platters, those came, um, I don't know if we really talked about them specifically for this. I kept showing them to you. It's like, and then these are going on. 
Um, and ultimately, we decided to include them. Th those were really nice to see here. I haven't seen those in a while. Yeah, there are three in the show, and they have their assemblages with these tchotchkes incorporating also your ceramics, which are great. I saw there were some hands over here. Yeah, Anthony. Um, it seems to me that your, your body, your work, and the um, um, is, is perfectly made for the aesthetic of both your galleries, Kavi Gupta and Robert's projects. It really fits in well to the program. Tell me how that happened, or tell us how that happened. And how, it was you found them, they found you, and how did that happen? Because I follow both programs and I, it's, it's, it's perfectly suited for both of them. Yeah. Um, Do you want to repeat that? I don't know if people could hear that. Yeah, so the question is um, how the my work found its way, I suppose, into the programs that you're familiar with and and feel is like a perfect match for those programs. Um, and also I work with a third gallery in New York City, Sycamore Jenkins. So between the three of them. You know, I, I, um, I, I, I don't know if I have a great answer for that, other than that they show a lot of artists who I've paid attention to. Um, and I think that in meeting the people at those galleries, um, we share a kind of nuanced view about identity. And I think I would say that all of those people have their own relationship to identity that is not just about didactic ways of thinking about it, but it's um, inherently complex. There's no need to, to make it complex. It's more an acknowledgement of the way things really are. And um, I mean, one thing I'll say to, you know, I had a great conversation with, um, with Brent Sikama, um, and this may have been the first time we actually had a chance to really have a conversation, but really him sharing his experience of living through the AIDS crisis was, was great. I mean, not, it wasn't a great story, but it was, really, <laughs> it was really amazing to me to talk to someone who had experienced something that made art not the pinnacle. You know, like life, life is far more important and then there's art and art can be as important as you want it to be in the moment that you're engaging with it or talking about it um i've had the similar experience with bennett and julie i've had a similar experience with kavi and and this is what they want to support you know this is what they believe in in terms of of um what art is capable of what's important in it and the best thing about having the support of of all of the galleries has been the challenge of 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 taking taking the bar off of what I think is possible. You know, to have people in your life who are saying, what do you, what do you want to do? It's a continuation of what brought some of the best works here. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know what brought it there, but that's the best I can say to that. Any other? Yes, over there. I'm really fascinated by the way you use the words in, in, your, in your work. And it reminded me of like a Basquiat quote about how he would like, um, he would make uh, words in his paintings difficult to read so that people would try harder yeah. to read them. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but I'm curious about your um, Well, one thing that makes me think of is, well, the first time when I, I, I made a piece, I'm trying to think which piece it was. It, it was. it was the piece, it's not in this show, but it's um, the difference between you and me. There's a piece. And the color combinations I chose, I chose a really busy optic background, and then I chose, I think, a very pale bead. And so when it was done, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't read it. Like, what was the point? And, um, but then there was a bead worker who came up to me and who thought that was brilliant. And it was on view, and she came up and she said, this is incredible. She's like, you really have like embedded, it's no longer like a foreground background relationship but you really made this one surface that has content in it. And that, so that, that was something that then I learned and that kind of extends the way that I think about using, uh, you know, just the visualness of them. Um, and then I think, you know, the, um, sorry, the second half of your question was, oh yeah. So, um, so that just kind of extended. Now we play. I only have 19 colors to play with when it comes to beadwork, and sometimes they're out of stock, so we're down to 15. <laughs> um, waiting on Trans Aqua right now for three months. <laughs> um, I hope you bought a lot. We buy them out when we can. We do what we can. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, um, it, I look a lot at like uh, graphic posters, graphic histories. 
um, pay attention to like how color works, you know, break out the Pantone books and try to make things happen. In, in the, the Alive mm. tapestry, the wall hanging was really the idea to make it feel like, you know, vibrational, like mm. it was charged and, and of, of a congregation of faith. And this is a call and response. Mm. It's a beautiful question. Yes, any other questions? Yeah, in the back. You mentioned um, <coughs> Nina Simone earlier, who's work did not originate with political purpose, but more so evolved into that with the neighbor in her times. Would you say that's more or less how your work began to carry political undertones, or was that always your intent? Well, I was trained in the 90s, where we always would walk around and say, the personal is the political, the personal is the political. And, you know, it became a little tired at one point where I was like, all right, let's, not, let's stop this. But as I get older, the personal is the political. And, um, and so I, I used to talk very much about personal relationships. And, of course, in the 90s, there was lots of, of theories and ideas and examples of even in personal relationships, there's always power dynamics. There's always um, how those power dynamics shift. Um, is it abusive? Is it equal? Like these sorts of things. And I think as things began to shift what we're paying attention to in the media when they become more politicized, it's very easy to project those politics onto my work in terms of the language. And I'm somebody who really responds to that. So then I start thinking, okay, now I'm going to think more about other kinds of relationships. And right now, a lot of the ones I'm paying to, of course, have to do with like nationalism, you know, ideas about gender and those those sorts of power relationships. So, and then, you know, there's a piece that's titled "In Numbers Too Big to Ignore," which is um, quoting Helen Reddy, but it is, and I really wanted to focus on a design that, for me, was representative of the the massive numbers of missing and murdered Indigenous women. And I had just come back from from Winnipeg, where I didn't meet a single Native person who had not been impacted by that and the murals that were over, um, over the, the roads and things. But also I'm a teacher, so we were also at the same time um, negotiating talks about Black Lives Matter movements and students walking out. So it's kind of how it kind of triangulates into thinking about politics. Um, and now I look at a lot of Nina Simone footage and I realize as political as she was, Oftentimes, she lended her voice to a political movement, but I'm not sure that she was really a, like an activist per se, you know? And that's sometimes what I say to people. It's like, I know what I do well, and I don't identify as an activist, but I'm happy to lend my voice to activism. All right, well, we'll end on that note. Thank you so much, right, Jeff. Thank you very much. Yeah.